USA is busy planning their next defeat. Since the last civil war in 1875, USA has never won a war. The US military typically operates under a strategy known as force projection, aiming to maintain the ability to project power globally to protect national, national interests and maintain regional stability. This strategy involves maintaining forward deployed forces, alliances, and partnerships with other countries, as well as investing in research, development, and technological advancements to enhance military capabilities. However, it is reasonable to assume that the United States, like any other country with a significant military capability, engages in strategic planning and contingency preparations for potential future military campaigns. These plans often involve assessing potential threats, developing military doctrines, conducting war games, and maintaining a state of readiness to respond to various scenarios. Out of this consideration, the Pentagon initiated a military campaign by bombing Yugoslavia in March 1999, attacked Afghanistan in October 2001, just after the staged attack on Twin Tower in New York, known as 9-11 incident. Two years later, launched a full-scale attack on Iraq, military campaign continued with Syria, Libya, Yemen, and now in Ukraine. However, USA lost each of these wars, yet they are provoking a confrontation with China to protect the interest of arms dealers like Raytheon or Boeing under the usual pretext of protecting democracy, etc. It is very important to realize, prior to the initiation of a military conflict, the ostensibly free press of USA and their NATO allies exposed their populace, along with that of the world, to both intensive and extensive media conditioning in favor of the planned, unprovoked conflict. In this context, let's listen to one such media conditioning campaign by one of the so-called free press of India that is assigned to project China as the warmonger working over time to pick a fight with India. Here is how the anchor is projecting China. Two Chinese experts, two Chinese officials, have given an assessment on India. They say India is no challenge for the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese Army. And this is not jingoistic bombast. This is their ignorance speaking. The men who made these statements are Zhao Xiao Zhu and Zhang Qi. Both hold the position or what they call senior colonel in the Chinese military. They're members of what you can call the PLA's brain trust. They work with China's leading military universities. So what they think shapes the strategy of the Chinese army. And that's why their opinion matters. Last week, the PLA sent these officials to the Shangri-La Dialogue. This is an annual security conference. It is hosted by Singapore, and it's attended by leading defense leaders and thinkers. So these PLA officials were there, and they spoke about India and the border standoff with China. I have their statements. Senior Colonel Zhao spoke about India's defense modernization. Listen to what he said. India is unlikely to catch up to China in the coming decades because of its weak industrial infrastructure, while China has built complex and systematic defense industrial platforms. And this is what his counterpart had to say, Senior Colonel Zhang. I'm quoting again. India has spared no effort in military modernization in a bid to become an impressive superpower as other countries have done. This was their opinion. They say India is lagging in defense manufacturing and hence poses no challenge to China. Despite China's economy being five times the size of India, and in the technological advancement of China is about 30 years ahead, media apparently has discovered information that a distinct mismatch. Let's take a listen. The anchor states, If this is the foundation of the PLA's military strategy, I say it's good news for India because it just demonstrates their ignorance. 
You see, there's a limited connection between military modernization and war preparedness. Modernization is about enhancing your country's military capabilities. It is important, yes, but only to an extent. Being ready for war involves a lot more than just having the latest and the greatest weapons. You need many other things to fight a war, like infrastructure, strategy, training, knowing the lay of the land, understanding the weakness of your adversary, and the experience of fighting and winning wars. We know that China is woefully inadequate in this department. China hasn't fought a war in more than four decades, so while the PLA's military may be growing, its soldiers remain untested. Most of China's military arsenal has not seen any real combat. The ability of their soldiers to use their weapons is unproven. Compare that to India. Our soldiers are in better shape, they know their weapons well, and they have combat experience. Do you know what else you need to fight a war? You need a robust economy. Now, China's economy is much bigger than India, no two ways about it. But at this point, it's too fragile to handle a war. Remember what I said about living in a bubble and buying your own propaganda? Chinese strategists are doing that. Their country is struggling with a deep debt crisis. Local governments are sinking, they owe large amounts of money, and they're running out of cash. She has obviously been instructed to spew venom against China. Purpose of such narrative is to project China as the warmonger out to invade India. Also, here is an example of how media promotes perception management by inflating India's technological capabilities out of proportion. If conditioning with such narrative serves any interest, <clears throat> it is the interest of armed dealers of USA. Everyone else has everything to lose. Here is an example of China's technological achievement in the field of undersea tunnel, which is far superior to that of most advanced countries like Germany, Japan, or USA. Be amazed by China's stunning engineering feat, an undersea tunnel stretching for an astonishing 76 miles. This groundbreaking project seeks to surpass previous records and redefine what infrastructure can achieve taking all previous records out of consideration in its endeavor. As an illustration, think about driving from New York City to Boston, then adding 30 additional miles for this underwater tunnel, making it the longest of its type globally. This remarkable feat of engineering will connect Chinese cities Dalian and Yantai by crossing Bohai Strait. Not only will this crossing cover vast distances, its undersea passage may encounter powerful tides, currents, and unpredictable weather conditions as it travels. Not simply digging an underwater hole would suffice here. This endeavor calls for creative problem-solving skills coupled with relentless engineering challenges as it overcomes nature's hurdles to success. It is truly astonishing how large-scale this project is. Imagine an expansive network of tunnels, bridges, and artificial islands stretching 76 miles over land and sea. Here, Colonel Praveen Swahini is explaining how Americans are instigating India to project herself as the leader of Global South, which is nothing but a false propaganda. According to the colonel, it is only a great exercise in perception management. Let's take a listen to his narrative. Why importance is being given? I mean, after all, India is both the president of the G20 this year as well as the Shanghai Cooperation or SEO. But the importance is given to G20. Why? Because A, closeness with the Americans and the West and B, that the Americans are supporting us to project ourselves, to project India as the leader of Global South, which actually it is not. So it is a great exercise in perception management in projection that look, we are a great nation. I mean, we have to understand where we stand. Media continues their narratives with the same line of propaganda. But this time it is about China's aggressive intentions against Tibet. An issue to which the people of Tibet are not concerned at all. In fact, average Tibetan in Tibet leads a far better quality of life than their counterpart in India. They also have far better career option being a part of China. Yet, these media sponsored by Anglo-American West make it a point to broadcast fictitious horror stories 
to help their listeners to develop a negative attitude against China so that in case of a cooked up conflict with China, public opinion may remain on the side of American arms dealers. Here is how the media is depicting China. Perhaps they wanted to capture the Dalai Lama or worse. So a decision was made that the Dalai Lama would flee Tibet. He disguised himself as a soldier, gathered his family and advisors and fled. They traveled only at night. For two weeks, no one knew where he was. Killed, captured or simply lost. Then on the 30th of March 1959, he re-emerged in India. He requested political asylum, which was granted. Back in Tibet, the Dalai Lama's decision was proven right. China slaughtered thousands of Tibetan soldiers, burned down monasteries, executed monks. It was ethnic cleansing. Seven decades later, the wounds are still fresh. The Dalai Lama is public enemy number one in China. He lives in India's Dharamshala. Tibetans are still treated as second-class citizens in China. Their culture is being wiped out. Their monasteries are targeted and their spiritual leader is called a separatist. Today, the world has largely forgotten Tibet. There is a Tibetan government in exile here in India, but the movement is losing steam. As long as the Dalai Lama is alive, people may remember it. But after that, he's 87 years old. So the question of succession remains. China wants to appoint its own. Will the Dalai Lama name a successor? So far, he's given mixed signals. Once he talked about ending the institution or appointing a woman Lama or maybe electing one. An entire generation of Tibetans is growing up outside their homeland. They've never seen Tibet. Maybe they never will. That is the legacy of China's invasion. They got the land, but not the people. In these two news clips, two private Indian channels are paid to project that China is the one provoking USA by approaching too close to their warship near Chinese border. How US and China's warship nearly collided in South China Sea. This one is from First Post. As always, China says one thing but does another. The PLA has continuously harassed navies in the South China Sea. Such operations have become more frequent recently, but the U.S. faces a dilemma here. Second report from Vion. Dangerous interaction between Chinese and U.S. warships in Taiwan Strait. As you can see on your screen, a Chinese warship is sailing across Chung Hoon's path in calm waters. In fact, it came as close as 150 yards. What these pro-Western channels will never point out is what a U.S. warship is doing in Taiwan, which is next to the international border of China. Moreover, whole world, including UN and USA, has accepted that there is only one China and that Taiwan is an integral part of China. How will USA react if Chinese or Russian warships maintain vigilance around the coast of Cuba. Game plan behind projection of such news items is to mobilize public opinion before provoking military conflicts with China so that U.S. arms dealers can boost up their business at the expense of destruction of human habitation and human lives. Purpose of our narrative is to caution common people that armament industries are merchants of death. They are also called military industrial complex. These industries are owned, managed and operated by the best brain available from third world countries. Tentacles of this industrial complex reach far and wide. They influence and even dictate government decision-making processes. They have control over the university curriculum and various departments of research, which allow them to condition the young generation to think in favor of war and violence. Their control over mainstream media makes it possible to condition common people to support war under the bogus pretext of def defending democracy, freedom, and human rights. The main agenda of the armament industries is to influence governments to wage needless war under the false pretext and make profit by selling armaments. For them, human life, habitation, and civilization mean nothing. 
Their first and last objective is profit by selling military hardware for which there must be perpetual war throughout the world. This explains why at any given time, war is going on somewhere. Since the end of the last war in 1945, an estimated 260 armed conflicts erupted throughout the world. Of that, 250 were instigated by Anglo-American West. This implies beneath the facade of glittering urban civilization of so-called developed and prosperous nations are lurking decision makers who are in fact merchants of death, savages in civilized clothes. If you like what you see and hear, please subscribe, 